awfully quiet in here. Just, just trying to understand what's happening. Well, I mean, we're just waiting we're just... for the. Uh, we're we're just waiting for a couple of minutes okay. before everyone joins. Yeah, yeah. As as you know, Kirti is the uh, vice chair of the group, um, so he's concerned that uh, there is silence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how do I say your name? Sorry, uh, is it uh, Hao Han? Or... Yes, that's correct. Very rarely that people get it right on the first try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm pretty excited to hear a lot about AMM. So I'm doing a bit on token engineering myself as well. So I'm just really charged about trying to understand uh, a little more about your um, value proposition and, and how you intend to solve some of the biggest problems in the world. We seem to have a, a pretty good audience here, uh, 21. Uh, 21 is the magic number. So we're gonna start in a minute. Uh, first, I'm going to start recording. So, uh, I mean, I've already started recording, sorry. Um, the um, There are two things to say before we start. One is, that we do follow the Linux Foundation's antitrust policy. So we are bound by that antitrust policy wherever we are. Um, so if you do not wish to follow that antitrust policy, please uh, uh, get off the call. That is one. The second item is the code of conduct, which is that we all uh, agree to abide by the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, which boils down to one thing, which is that we are not going to be disagreeable to each other, even when we are disagreeing. Um, so in, in a nutshell, and if you're not speaking, uh, please go on mute. Uh, because otherwise it's highly um, disruptive to the proceedings. And I want to introduce now Haohan Zhu, who's the uh, CEO of Epiphany and Roxy, two projects that I have written about and which you should know about he has his uh, legs firmly planted in both uh, traditional finance and in the world of DeFi. So without waiting too much, let's uh, start talking about how, uh, I mean, uh, how Han is going to make his presentation. Uh, thank you, how Han for showing up and let me bid you Welcome. Hi, Vipin. I uh, apologize. I, I kind of just uh, dropped because my internet connection went out, but I'm glad it sounds like I made it back on time. Yeah, you're, you're right on the money with respect to, well, to use a phrase, you're right on the money. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, may I start? Yeah, and let's let's give uh, uh, one more direction, which is basically he uh, Hawan will go through the presentation, and you can ask okay. him questions after he finishes. Uh, it is not uh, right to interrupt the flow of the presentation unless your question is so burning that you cannot restrain yourself. Anyway, without uh, waiting too much, uh, let's go hear how on, which is why we are here anyway. Okay, sure, sure. All right. Um, so uh, good morning to everyone who's um, tuning in at the moment. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Hyperledger and uh, Vipin for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Hao Han. I'm the CEO and founder of two companies in the blockchain space, Epiphany and Roxy. So. Um, Epiphany is a digital asset trading network. You can think of it as an exchange of crypto exchanges. We, we want to unify the fragmented markets in the digital, in digital assets to provide traders 
the best liquidity and price discovery for digital assets. And Roxy is a blockchain technology driven payment network that unifies the global payment systems so that um, banks, central banks, payment companies and uh, consumers can make the fastest, least expensive um, payment to anywhere in the world. So that is a brief background about myself and my companies. Um, so today I want to share some of my findings um, uh, when building Roxy and discuss how DeFi protocols uh, can bring additional benefits um, or even completely reshape the international remittance world. Uh, so um, as we all have heard, uh, Bank of America recently joined Paxos Settlement Service, um, which, is, which is an added proof for the entire uh, financial industry on blockchain technology. But uh, today I wanna focus on how not only blockchain technology itself, um, but also the blockchain applications can impact tr traditional finance. Um, as some of you know, last year, uh, DeFi started to gain a lot of traction and it created a large impact on how traditional finance works. Uh, one of the most notable examples is how Uniswap, a decentralized crypto exchange, reshaped how um, crypto was traded by using its innovative automated market maker model to change the traditional central limit order book model, uh, which equity and FX markets still use today. So last September, Uniswap surpassed Coinbase in monthly trading volume by nearly two billion. Uh, that is more than ten percent. Uh, so, so this will be the agenda for today. Uh, for those of you who are very familiar with the first two parts of the agenda, uh, please bear with me or just treat it as a quick review. Um, yeah. So uh, to get into the uh, topic, uh, first I want to talk about um, how the international remittance world uh, works. So, um, uh, international remittance. Uh, it's just another way of saying cross-border remittance, uh, a cross-border money transfer uh, has many has many problems with different causes today. It is uh, very slow, expensive, it's risky, it lacks transparency, and it's challenging for smaller banks to perform. So, um, so for the purpose of today's topic, I will focus on the expensive problem, which is partially caused by FX trading. I will explain where uh, where it is in the international remittance process and how it can be improved with the DeFi protocols. So uh, uh, so here's the image. Uh, here's the image I borrowed from the internet uh, to demonstrate the relationships between all the participants in FX trading uh, in the international remittance context. So um, banks constantly need to perform uh, FX due to you know, different business demands. Um, so the FX may not happen every time a remitter is sending money. However, the bank usually quotes the remitter and FX rate around the real time market price. Uh, so to the remitter, it, does, it doesn't it does make a difference. Yeah. Did I we lose we did. Uh, Havan? I, yeah, I think we did. He may have an unstable network connection. He, he 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 may have an unstable yeah maybe he's not even aware that he's off yeah i'm, I'm gonna contact him yeah because uh sometimes you when you're speaking you do not uh you're not aware So this is kind of interesting because it, uh, if we cannot um, manage a Zoom connection, how can we go to uh, DeFi uh, with the surety, right? <laughs> Network is the risk. Yes. So Mike, you have anything to add to this or? Because uh, you're visible now, Mike Fortman. Uh, you're muted, Mike. I'm on mute. No, um, except that uh, it's a, it's a good thing that maybe that Zoom isn't running a uh, isn't the one running a DeFi platform. <laughs> but we'll get a hold of. Help. But I, I don't uh, think it has anything to do with Zoom. It has to do with local connectivity. Talk about yes, decentralization. Yes, yes, right. Talk about decentralization. Yes, yes. Uh, in that sense, that every one of us is. Uh, sort of got their own 
connection. <laughs> so, so if you have a poor connection, it's very difficult to uh, take the conversation forward. Dan, you have unmuted. Is there any reason? Are you going to say something? Because yeah, I was going to say that even for centralized networks, there's a challenge with network. Yeah, yeah. Every, every, uh, uh, everything that relies on, uh, you know, connectivity from unreliable sources is a is challenged. Um, one of the things is that um, that we have to talk about is oh, how on you're back. Wonderful. Oh, we were I there. I apologize. This nope. happens very rarely, and this is the worst time for this to happen. I apologize for that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you now. We can see you. We can uh, see the screen. Yeah, I'm sorry. Where did you lose me? On Here, when you're talking right? about the... Uh, the international remittance uh, infrastructure as it exists today. Mm -hmm. That's when we lost you about, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the banks have to quote a rate, uh, re almost a real time rate. Okay, yeah. Oh, I, I see. Okay. Uh, I'll just uh, continue off there. So, uh, yeah. So like, uh, just like, just like, so I was saying there's no, um, there's no centralized exchange for FX, so FX works uh, like a like an OTC market, and um, just like crypto trading, there's no centralized market that trades a certain FX pair. However, there are primary markets um, like London, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo. A lot of trading today, um, it's done through there and through electronic messaging or trading system FX. So, like this picture shows. Um, the foreign exchange market has a lot of participants, um, banks, uh, international corporations, central banks, investment firms, hedge funds, FX brokers, and investors, etc. So it is by far the largest market in the world with 6.6 .6 trillion per day volume back in 2019. So, so uh, when, you, when you go to the bank and most online um, providers to convert currencies, you most likely won't get the market price that traders or institutions get in the market. Um, the bank, uh, the bank exchange house or the remittance company, or whatever your point of contact is, will mark up the price so that they can make a profit. So the U.S. dollar to Mexican peso price is like say like nineteen point eight, like today somewhere around there, and the market saying it costs nineteen point eight. Mexican pesos to buy one US dollar. At the bank, however, it can cost 20.5 Mexican pesos. So banks and online remittance services um, are allowed to add a markup and charge fees. So the difference between um, the mar so the difference between the market exchange rate and the market rate bank and the exchange rate bank charge is where the mar where the bank make their profit. So sometimes this cost is higher because banks have to go to brokers and brokers will charge an additional fee as well, which later on is imposed onto you as an end user. So since it is an OTC marketing FX trading, you do not get to see the exact market price at which your currency is uh, converted by the bank. Uh, so uh, although as an end user, you can open multiple bank accounts in different countries, you might send money to and you know, trade FX market yourself, it is just too much hassle for the average person. Um, so because uh, of all I explained above, today remitters are losing large amounts of money to FX spreads or just hidden costs that banks charge them or, or just charge by other institutions to banks that impose onto you. Um, yeah, so that's a little background on the on FX trading in the remittance world. So, uh, so, so what is decentralized exchange using an automated market maker model and how does it work? Um, so an automated market maker is a type of decentralized exchange protocol where um, the liquidity of the market comes from pools of funds that are contributed by the users and, and the price of an asset that, and the price of the asset relies on a mathematical formula instead of supply and demand in the uh, order book model. So instead of using an order book like a traditional exchange, um, assets are as a price according to a price algorithm. So, um, so this formula can actually uh, vary with, with each protocol. 
And for example, Uniswap uses X times Y equals to K, where X is the amount of one token in the liquidity pool and Y is the amount of the other token. So in this formula, K is a fixed constant, um, meaning uh, the, the pool's total liquidity always has to remain the same. Um, other automated market makers will use other formulas for you know, other use cases. Um, so Uniswap was the first one to do this. Uh, so for simplicity, I will use them as an example to demonstrate how it works here. So an automated market maker, um, like very similar to an order book exchange in that there's many trading pairs, for example, like uh, Ethereum against USDT. Um, however, you don't need to have a counterparty on the other side to make a trade. So instead, you, you interact with a smart contract that um, makes the market like makes the market for you. Um, the uh, the people uh, the people who are actually allowing the smart contract to ma make the market are the ones providing liquidity into the smart contract. Uh, these people are called liquidity providers. So, so uh, liquidity providers add funds to the liquidity pools. Uh, you could think of a liquidity pool as a big pile of funds that traders can trade against. So, in return for providing liquidity to the protocol. Um, uh, liquidity providers are fees from from the trades that can happen in their pool. So in, in the case of Uniswap, uh, liquidity providers deposit equivalent value of two tokens, for example, like 50% Ethereum and 50% USDT uh, to the Ethereum against USDT pool. So the amount of each token will be will be determined by the pricing algorithm at the moment. Um, so when a uh, so so when a trader is trading on Uniswap. Um, so, uh, sorry, apologize. The amount of token that you have to put in will be determined by the pricing algorithm at the moment. So when a, when a trader is trading on Uniswap, they're actually exchanging funds with a pool of liquidity. Uh, so anyone can become a market maker in this case. So as long as the person has a crypto wallet and the rewards are you know, determined uh, by the protocol. So for example, Uniswap charges traders 0.3% uh, fee that goes directly to uh, liquidity providers. Um, so yeah, in, in summary, uh, what Uniswap did using automated market maker was that they decentralized uh, the role of market makers to the people and allowed people to kind of reap the benefits of market making and take on the risk, but in, in a much easier way. Um, it, you, you no longer need the sophistication or the, nor the capital to uh, requirement to become a market maker. So. Um, yeah, so like how can how can all this uh, be applied to, you know, international events and make it better? Uh, so if you kind of understood the previous parts, um, you probably already have a rough idea. So uh, so that is, uh, we can use the AMM protocol to facilitate FX trading and benefit the international events by um, eliminating intermediaries uh, like market makers, brokers, banks, and pass the benefits to the remitters. So, however, the solution is not as simple as, um, you know, just taking the entire AMM model into FX trading. It, 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 ha it has a few tweaks. So, um, so, 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 the, so these are like something we've done in Roxy. So I just want to share them. So like, uh, so like one of them would be, you know, using an external Oracle instead of using an equation to price an asset. So, um, so to, to improve the pricing curve. So uh, these oracles can be, you know, market data providers used by major FX markets. Um, so by using the mid price of bid and ask prices provided by the market data, uh, which is consistent with the real time prices in the FX market, um, the price curve uh, generated will be smoother and um, provide a trading price closer to the current market price. So which can effectively reduce trading slippage. On the other hand, um, reduce traders' trading losses. Uh, and, so, and also reducing permanent losses. Um, so automated market makers um, kind of passively rely on arbitrage algorithms to adjust prices usually. Um, and the external Oracle uh, also proactively flattens the price curve on this, in the same direction to ensure that, you know, the area around the market price remains stable. Uh, so so, the, so this, this ensures that there's sufficient liquidity to uh, be continuously available basically. Um, so like in other words, like most of the funds that are concentrated near the market price, um, uh, uh, which makes trading more uh, active and uh, frequent and they increase the utilization of funds. Um, 
so uh, like like I illustrated in one of the early slides, um, remitters take on most of the cost that is that is charged between intermediaries by their first point of contact, and uh, remitters are getting very little on their uh, on their idle capital. Uh, so with MM in place, uh, we can eliminate intermediaries while passing benefits to the remitters who can contribute liquidity to the MM protocols and earn earn the profits that is uh, earned by the FX market makers usually. Um, yeah, so for those of you know, who, who know impermanent loss of the AMM protocol, it will be minimal since the assets themselves do not fluctuate much in value, um, like uh, as much as cryptocurrencies. And the returns are high since um, FX has high volume to liquidity ratio in this case, yeah. Yeah, so that is, so that is all for the content I'm presenting today. And I'm very open to uh, some questions. Yeah, thank you, everyone. That's a, that's a quick walkthrough of this whole uh, space uh, in very rapid uh, way. And there are um, some questions which seems to have answered uh, been answered on the uh, on the call itself. Uh, I think the more interesting aspects of this is one is obviously uh, you know how to deal with volatility um, in the in your uh, curve the construction of your curve we have obviously uh, tried to uh, smooth the curve out without uh, rapid uh, jumps and jerks uh, uh, that is characteristics of the characteristic of a crypto crypto market can you mm -hmm. explain that uh, that you know that concept a little more because that seems to be the the major you know sort of innovation that your uh, your your uh, solution has compared to let's say uniswap or something else so can yeah, you... sure. Yeah. So, um, so you, so you need, so the, for the automated market maker protocols, you can kind of, uh, so personally, I see it as two parts. One, one part is, is the automated market maker part, which allows anyone to provide liquidity. Uh, and the other part is the, is the pricing is how like each one of these protocols do pricing. So, so you need, you need swap, and most of them use like an equation. You need to, is the um, constant product model. So like in, in that case, when, um, so in, in that case, like K has to stay constant. So uh, X, X and Y, sorry, I'm trying to go to the slide that explains that. Yeah, X, Y are always changing um, because like people are always swapping funds in and out of the pool. So, so um, and the pricing algorithm is dependent on these variables as well. So like sometimes, um, sometimes the slippage can be very big, as you can imagine. Uh, like when you make a trade, you can have impact on the variables in the equation and uh, the price can be impacted too. So, uh, and you don't want that to happen because like, because like generally like Ethereum or like, or like any other popular crypto that's being traded in Uniswap have other markets as well. And um, they may have better prices. And this is like a problem that happens in crypto, like just in general, like there's too many markets for the same currency and uh, you're just gonna get bad slippage wherever you wherever you are. But Uniswap with the pricing, it's a smart model, but it, it can make slippage a lot worse. Uh, so so a lot of protocols have done things to, um, to use different equations or just you, or like like what we do, we just use an external oracle. So we basically um, we would just like use an external market uh, market data source, uh, like probably like a very trustable source used by like the major FX markets. Uh, so so in this case, um, so in this case we we have a we have a new uh, we have a better price curve um, that's no longer dictated by equations. So uh, when user when users put in funds, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, uh, like what, what are the equation tells you? It can just be the market price. So, so when, so when you're, when you're being traded against as a liquidity provider, you lose less. And when you're trading, the liquidity provider actually provides funds to a ratio that's closer to the market price. Yeah. Um, 
So this this is uh, Kirti here. Just a quick question: could, could you explain the mechanism for the liquidity uh, piece? So if you go on slide eight, I'm referring to slide eight. Yeah. So um, what are LP shares? Sorry, I didn't quite understand that. So is that? Oh yes, yes. So LP shares. Um, so so for a normal user, um, the concept of LP shares is not as important. So LP shares are basically just like um, receipt of your liquidity in the pool. Okay. Yeah, so if I transferred my LP shares to you, you can like, pro you would probably like, you, you're entitled to the to the liquidity that I just provided. So like whenever you deposit liquidity into Uniswap protocol, uh, they will give you some LP shares. The LP shares just, you know, equates to uh, like however, however much uh, liquidity you have compared to the entire pool, yeah. Okay, okay. So this is pretty interesting because uh, I'm looking at the balancer protocol, which is based yes. on the value, value function. Um, I'm trying to kind of understand this broadly. It's a very similar model. So did you say this uses a different function altogether, Uniswap pool? Yeah, I think uh, balancer uses a, a very different function. Uh, I balancer actually is trying to improve up on Uniswap with the equation, like and, and many other aspects. But like I think Uniswap, it's very. Um, it was the first to do the automated market maker protocol. Yeah. Um, I think th that is a cool part because like because you know not not only does this change things in like FX trading um, and like international admins, but also it can be done in like like equity trading or other trading as well because like. Usually, the usually how the markets work today is like everything is pretty much done on the central limit order book model. You just mm -hmm. see order book, and the market makers are the ones like putting in these quotes. Like they're the ones facilitating the trades. Like it's it's very crucial to have healthy market making to have an efficient market in a lot of these uh, in like all assets essentially. But like automated market maker essentially completely reshapes that. So like anyone can become a market maker to provide as long as it just it just um so like liquidity is provided in a very different way and everyone's rewarded for providing liquidity just like how you know market makers are in like traditional equity or fx yeah they will get like rebates or can you know make our and do arbitrage yeah interesting so um also another point that i wanted to touch upon is this all of this stuff is non-custodial right so this is non-custodial and completely DeFi in nature because it is running on completely on contracts. Yes, I, um, it, it it is. So yeah, so so I'm not sure like what you mean by custodial. So I like, I think it is custodial by the contract. Yeah, right. but it's not about like no like single party custodies. You know any of the funds. So like anyone can use this as as long as you know people have a crypto wallet. And mm -hmm. uh, when when you when you send your tokens to the contract, the contract will give you. LP shares in return to prove that it to, is a receipt uh, for these tokens being deposited in the pool. And um, and uh, the contract now has all your tokens. Yeah, which you can redeem anytime with the LP shares. Yeah. So the contract is in, if, in a sense, a omnibus wallet. Uh, yes, yeah, you can think of it like that, yeah. Meaning it aggregates all of the um, different uh, people's assets in a uh, in a limited number of wallets. I, I don't know whether it's one or you know let's say yeah, five. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So for for example, like the liquidity pool contract, like the the set of contract for the liquidity pool for like Ethereum against USDT, let's just say, has all the has all the um, funds that liquidity providers for that pair provided into it yeah and they distinct they, they like distinguish like which funds belongs to who with the lp shares yeah so it seems to me another way to look at this is a little bit like you're running it's running an auction and i guess the question is is the auction continuous or is it timed because if it's continuous there's definitely the possibility of um, favorably gaining market, I can um, put in a certain amount to sell versus a small amount to buy that will push the market, that has to push the market down, transact a small amount, 
and then re remove the rest of my order and then come back and turn and go the other way. I mean, oh no, uh, um, or maybe, maybe I, I didn't explain it uh, like like very clearly. Um, or maybe you can help me understand. Like, I'm I'm not sure how it works as an auction in this case, because like um, because like when when you're trading, you're trading against the pool of funds, so there's no like actively like bidding or like asking. There's no like race in price, like because auction like people are like giving you prices, right? But the prices here are like given by the equation. Yeah. Well, the auction, the way that the auction price is determined is about by the volume that's been contributed on either side. I assume there's a buyer, there are buyers and there are sellers and a mm -hmm. certain volume at no price. And then a price is determined based on, you know, the liquidity, ba the balancing of liquidity. Right. I mean, if I'm a buyer and you're a seller, mm -hmm. and maybe me is misunderstanding, um, to be honest. If I'm a buyer and you're, oh, sorry, if I'm misunderstood, then maybe a re-explanation is the right choice rather than an example. Yeah, so, uh, so the, yeah, there's no, re there's really no like buyers and sellers in the MM protocol. So, um, so uh, during any transaction, there's, there's only like two roles, just a buyer, uh, just, so like in the buying situation, just a buyer and the liquidity provider, like that's it. Yeah, so like there's no uh, there's no counterparty on the other side. So so how it so let's just say right now there's no buyers or sellers at all. And uh, they're they're like for simplicity, I'm just like oversimplifying the example. So like there's a bunch of liquidity providers who all provided like tokens into the pool. Uh, and and by the way, when you provide liquidity, you have to put in um you have to put in both tokens. So when you're providing liquidity for the Ethereum against USDT pair, you have to provide both Ethereum and USDT pair. And uh, however much you however much you provide is determined by the pricing equation. So after a bunch of liquidity providers provide the funds into the pool, a trade a buyer or seller comes in. When you're when you're buying Ethereum, you have to you're buying with USDT, right? So you have to put USDT into the pool and take Ethereum out of the pool. So you're you're exchanging with the pool, yeah. And how much the pool thinks you should pay for Ethereum? It's determined that by the pricing uh, by the pricing equation. Yeah. So, um, I have a question. yeah, uh, money. Maybe you can answer some of this uh, stuff about how it's different from an auction yeah, because so you are the expert. The, the, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that it's in a centralized exchange, you are there is a price at the exchange. In the AMM protocol, you are looking at as if I'm a buyer or a seller. I am looking at an external price to come up and say, oh, this is better for me to buy or sell the, uh, from, the, from the liquidity pool. So that works as long as there's an external reference price, right? If, 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 for example, if all centralized market goes down, argument say, where is the reference price? You mean for the for the case of uh, uh, automated market maker? Correct. For Correct. No. Yeah, because you know why would I want to buy? I, you know, forget about the liquidity provider. I'm a trader. Uh, mm -hmm. I look at the refer I look at the reference price elsewhere, and I see what's in the pool is in favorable to, to me if I buy or sell Ethereum. So then I accordingly make a decision to you know uh, to put dollars and take take out Ethereum or put uh, Ethereum and take out dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's because I have a reference price from most likely a centralized source. Oh, I see your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think, I think I kind of briefly mentioned, so like, um, in order to have like price that's healthy in the NN protocol, um, these protocols kind of rely on like arbitragers, uh, a lot of times. So like, so you're, you're hundred percent right that because there's no reference price and, uh, like the the price in the MM, or the price of like Ethereum in the MM protocol can essentially be like very very far from like the centralized markets. But however, mar arbitrators would take advantage of this. So that's why like when Uniswap first came out, there are a lot of like people who are trying to copy Uniswap. So uni it's open source. So like so like people just made new uni Uniswaps and like they they like the the, con the contracts were like Ethereum against USDT pool. The prices were like like insanely far like ethereum can be like a thousand and the pool can just be like 800 
that's just because like people haven't discovered oh there's a new there's a new like you know fake uni swap out there uh, but like as soon as people discovered there were these like smaller uni swaps out there they just started doing arbitrage to these pools to facilitate trading volume so like part of the reason why Uniswap became like gained so much trading volume was because of that because of your point yeah there's no reference price like it, there's no external reference price so like the price here is determined that by the algorithm so it constantly deviates from you know whatever reference it, referencing exchange people are using so like arbitrators are constantly taking advantage of this but right now today is very hard to do that the market is relatively equal uh, because um, you know Ethereum gas fee is too high. Every time you place a transaction into Uniswap, you need to pay gas fee. Yeah, so there's relatively like very little room for arbitrage. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so to, to add, I mean, to refer to the original point about auction, this is a continuous market, a contiguous market, as opposed to an auction where there is a you know a set, set period comes in, now everybody contributes, and then a price gets uh, you know uh, set. And that's when you know the auction uh, really kicks in. Uh, as yes, to, yes. This is very similar. This is somewhere between, let's say, an auction and a, a and a, and a centralized exchange, because in centralized exchange, assuming that it's got a lot of liquidity, it, it is it's continuously executing. Here, there can be moments of liquidity in an AMM. However, I take your point. As more and more AMMs gain power and and is it becomes almost behaves like a centralized exchange. Yes. Yes. There's like a lot of things. Um, yeah, AMM is just like a very different um, uh, animal than you know centralized market. Like some like because most of the transactions, all the transactions are on chain, and uh, when you see large trade, you can essentially front run the trade with like more gas fee. Um, that happens actually. So there are like bots that monitor trades like going to Uniswap, and they will like pay with a higher gas fee to front run that large trade. Um, yeah, and, I mean, and also you need, yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, no problem. So the, 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 you know, the gas piece is more of a temporary phenomenon. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry too much because you have layer two solutions coming on and, and also yeah. other people. So it's more of, you know, how, how reliable these pools are compared to a, a centralized exchange. Yeah, um, I think, I think the, yeah, the pools are relatively more reliable because um, it's on the contract. And, 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 you know, like the contracts already pre-written and there's no, you know, private keys to a contract. So it's very difficult to hack the pool but versus a centralized exchange, like market makers or anyone on the exchange can get hacked. That, so that's like the issue with the centralized exchanges. So like, I think, but in terms of pricing, yeah, the, the like the pool, the, the, um, it can, it can not be very reliable depending on the equation. Um, that's why Uniswap came up with V3. They were trying to improve. They, they came up with this thing called price bands. You can choose what, um, like within what price bands you want your pool to be working. Yeah. So that means some kind of a, a high water and low water marks that yeah. allow for trading uh, to happen with your, with your uh, um, you know, whatever you put into the pool. I mean, I think uh, the main point is uh, whether centralized, decentralized, or else, elsewise, the two operating principles, which is liquidity and price discovery, operate no matter what. Uh, and if the deviation happens, then uh, there are meant to be auto, uh, either bot-based automatic trading or actual human arbitrageurs that will take care of that opportunity and uh, drive the price to the mean towards uh, uh, the right price. At least that is the idea. But uh, when there's huge volatility, uh, this can, ha you know, this can be, uh, overthrown, right? I mean, that's a whole problem with today's market too. I mean, uh, there's, I'm not talking about uh, DeFi, but any market uh, where you have, if you, if you do not have the relationship between liquidity and price, proper price, then you have, you know, 
like uh, Dan mentioned, oh, I can always offer, you know, a small amount in one and then the large amount, uh, try to drive the price in uh, various directions. Uh, so are you aware of any such uh, sort of feedback loops, negative feedback loops that uh, will cause the market to swing wildly and have there been such uh, uh, occasions in inside AMM protocols? Uh, yeah, so, so, so first of all, I think um, if I understood correctly, so like, um, by like offering more on one side and the other, the the protocol wouldn't allow you to because um when when you're when you're deposit so like when you're offering liquidity into the pool, um it, it's based on the price. So so you can't just choose you, what like when the market price of Ethereum, let's say it's like you know like a thousand right now. You, you can't just choose uh, choose to offer an arbitrary amount of Ethereum and an arbitrary amount of USDT to the pool. Like uh, however much you want, you put into the pool is is like determined by the protocol. So the protocol will tell you at this moment if you want to if you want to put in ten Ethereum into the pool, you have to put in at, at least this much USDT. Yeah. So 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 when when you are contributing to the pool, you're kind of it's kind of like a market maker. You're like an adverse selection, I guess. So you kind of agreeing that it's you kind of agreeing that like this is the price that I want people to to trade into Uniswap and utilize my funds for. Um, so so like uh, so so when you put funds into the pool, um, the the price the price is pretty much already like predetermined like the moment you do it, and um, and and then when volatility happens. So um, volatility on AMM protocol actually happens like in quite a few different ways. I'd say um, it, since it's very different from like traditional markets. So in the in the traditional market, volatility can happen, you know, due to like a, a huge discrepancy in like supply and demand in like short amount of time and like other and other things as well. But and, and that of course, well. Uh, will also uh, affect the IMN protocol because the arbitragers they will constantly try to, you know, uh, equate the price between the between centralized and decentralized. Uh, yeah. So and also AMM protocol volatility can cause by another thing, which let's say if one day everyone really hated Uniswap but just think like there's a huge security risk and they start removing funds from the pool, and all of a sudden now when traders come in they realize that there aren't enough funds in the pool to trade against so it's going to cause a lot of slippage and and all of a sudden and all of a sudden like the the constant model would change if the constant the so there's less in x and y so like constant will be like smaller and um and the, and the prices will get affected too so people removing funds from the pool would also affect the price because like uh, now people are less inclined to trade because there's less liquidity and um that can cause volatility too yeah but the formula that uh, x multiplied by y is equal to k, a constant, uh, presupposes a um, exchange rate between x and y, right? I mean, otherwise. Yes, yes. Um, so does that get constantly adjusted? Or how frequently does it get adjusted, meaning Obviously, the price of Ethereum versus USDT is a changing uh, amount. It is not constant. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, like whenever trades happen, I guess to your question. So, in that case, what do the how do the liquidity uh, providers, um, you know, have to act? Like, does fund gets withdrawn on one side, and, and pro, you know, because that the ratio now changes. If I am the liquidity provider. Oh, okay. I, I, I see your question. So, like, when when that changes and you haven't provided liquidity yet, like, and this happens quite often during like uh, volatile times when prices change all in Uniswap. So, like, when the price is changing quite frequently, you're trying to provide liquidity, and you sub you submit this transaction to the contract. The contract would tell you, oh, there's not sufficient 
amount of token on the other side because like by the, when the at the time when you provided liquidity the price was this but when the time it hits the contract it's like the price is something else the contract is kicking back your transaction so like so like so like uh yeah like a lot of times it doesn't work uh like when the market is volatile because the gas fee you're paying is probably also less uh so it so it has a delay uh yeah so to your, to your question when you already provided liquidity and your liquidity is in a pool so let's say when you provide your liquidity, you have, you know, like uh, you have like a thousand USDT and like eight, and one Ethereum. And, and as, as like price, as the price goes up, like you can, uh, as the price of Ethereum goes up, um, you can, you can end up with like, so, so sorry, let me just start over again. So like, let's say you have like a thousand USDT and one Ethereum, and that's like 1% of the pool, right? And people are trading, people are buying Ethereum, and uh, the pools, the pools having more USDT, and Ethereum is getting taken out. So right now, your one percent of the pool is probably like one thousand, like ten USDT versus like zero point however many Ethereum. But that's still one percent of the pool. Um, yeah. So so that's how your liquidity, which how your portion of liquidity will change as trade happens. Um, and 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 now, yeah, so, and. Those of you who know in permanent loss, this is like how that happens because now you no longer have 1,000 USDT and one Ethereum. You just have 1,000 however many USDT and zero point whatever Ethereum. And the price of Ethereum have changed. So your total dollar value also uh, differs from what you had in the beginning. Yeah. So that's the other... the small, small slippage in, in, in a liquidity provider, you, there is a risk and uh, that uh, when the price changes, you know, or, or when you want to withdraw, you could, uh, there is a slippage cost, slippage, you, slip page, you will lose some money. And, and a lot of it is compensated by, because of the fees you collect, because of the fees uh, from, from, the, from the pool, um, transaction fees in the pool gets distributed, but still potentially you could lose some, some money you know, as a liquidity provider. Not only that, there's a whole other issue of tax, is tax issues because you know you, you originally as you pointed out you put in one Ethereum and now you're going to 0.8 uh, and there's a price the difference you're buying and selling uh, I don't know how that has an impact on your on your on your tax issues uh, on tax issues you said yeah on tax yeah but the, basically the, the, you 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 you're no longer getting back the original tokens you're getting a completely different ratio of tokens when you when you, when, you, when you pull out of the liquidity so it, it, yeah. it still creates its own uh, tax issues yeah I, i'm actually yeah i'm actually not sure how tax will work for uniswap contract and um uh, like it, actually in the past couple of weeks i've like i've like spoke to a couple of accountants because i use uniswap quite a lot um and and, and it seems like the fee you generate would just be interest but um, since like since you're interacting with the contract, and uh, sometimes when you when you're removing your funds from the contract, like you said, like the value of things can be like very different. Um, and it's sort of like a very complex derivative, I guess. Um, yeah. So I'm still not sure how it would work. Yeah. How how does it all apply to the FX market? I mean, how do you how do you apply this AMM protocol? You know, coming back to what, how, how is it, is it going to be exactly similar or, you know, because in, in, in the marketplace of FX, it's, it's, it's a big bank that has the liquidity, liquidity today because of the way the flows have. Mm -hmm. How will this, uh, your, 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 your proposal will change that equation? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so first I want to point out one thing about um, AMM. So uh, in permanent loss, it's actually like a, it's like a actually a huge downside in MM, and this happens um, mostly in like trading pairs, like a stable coin against some like other crypto, um, when like the prices change a lot. But but one trading pair that's always done really really well on Uniswap is the USDC against USDT trading pair, because essentially just two stable coins trading against each other, right? And there's essentially zero risk, zero in permanent loss. On the trading pair because it's just one dollar to one U.S. dollar. So like the re and this trading pair has quite amount of quite amount of volume. Also, uh, so like if you stake in this pool, your returns are somewhere around like eight to ten percent every year. Like which is very very good compared to like financial markets. 
So, so like I, I based, I realized that, uh, so I realized MN protocol actually works very well on like very stable assets, which like fiat is relatively stable, um, uh, like most countries. <laughs> um, yeah, and and, uh, and uh, in FX market, so like you said, banks are most timely liquidity providers. But if you, but if you look at how the market works, like remitters or like the end users or like people with like savings account at banks. They put their money in the bank, but like sometimes the bank will leverage these mo these money to like market makers, um, like and, and like other traders as well, and and like these people who leverage money from the bank, which are yours, are getting like a crazy amount of benefits in the FX market because they they like make they like make money trading or market making, however, and and banks also get benefits by prov uh, by you know providing liquidity to the market. Either they market make the FX market themselves, or they lend that money to market makers in the FX market. Um, so, so this essentially changes the whole game. So like end users who, who originally deposit money at the bank for the bank and those institutions to reap the benefits. Like now that model has changed. The end user can now just have a crypto wallet and directly market make themselves and directly FX trade themselves into the pool so their trade so they're utilizing funds that's being deposited by other users as well and um and for end user you're also putting in funds with other users to trade you're getting much more return than what you're doing with your money at the bank today it, just in the fx trading context yeah so so that's kind of my thought process behind that i'm not sure if i really clarified that enough no, no, that, that's good yeah it, 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 it comes to the point i mean i just want to highlight uh, that there are hedge funds are now trying their feet into this marketplace. Um, they're using uh, Aave is creating a separate hedge uh, pool for the institutional marketplace. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, is that something that you would be also thinking in, in similar terms? Yes, yeah, I, I'm pretty, um, I follow pretty closely on DeFi. So yeah, that's something I'm, sim I'm thinking of. Yeah, and uh, like you said, like I think that proves how well the MM model works. Because it's very hassle-free, you just need the capital. You don't even need the sophistication of like market makers. Like you don't need certain algorithm to be market making. Um, so, so I think it's so I think it's a very good model, and uh, I'm I'm definitely thinking about that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and like I like I don't mean to like talk about like Roxy too much. Yeah, but like for us, like every um, like every node or every like partner that we work with. Has to be KYC. Like even for our like consensus layer, which is our like Roxy chain, like every like we use like an alliance chain model. So like every node, um, like we have to KYC every node because in the in the in the you know in in the finance world, like we need to uh, fulfill the compliance needs. Yeah. I was just I just wanted to go back to the point on what you were proposing for the remitten the remitters to then just be using the swap function as because they would ultimately act like unknowing arbitrageurs. I mean, there'd be a central, there's a central place they could go to, which is called the currency markets as they understood now, or they'd be looking for, I assume, a better price um, on these things and sort of acting as the arbitrage mm -hmm. uh, as their traffic is coming, is coming through. Or are you proposing mm -hmm. that they should be liquidity providers? Just because I was thinking two reasons, they don't generally have both of the currencies or the they're trying to like submit the uh, remit the funds yeah uh, yeah so uh like a couple of things i want to answer there so like first um first there's uh, there are ways to provide liquidity so uniswap you have to provide both the tokens there are ways to provide liquidity you, where you can provide only one side and for us we're we're, we're doing we're, we're we're doing that I, I, yeah what i think it's actually already finished so you can provide liquidity on just one side um it, it, the, how it works is actually pretty complex, so maybe I won't like spend too much time into that. It's it's in our white paper, but uh, uh, yeah, but you can yeah you can provide liquidity to get more returns, so that's that. But if you just want to remit, there's more to it. So if you think about it, uh, the reason why this plays so well in international mints is not because it's just a new model for trading. It's actually because how DeFi works. So if you think about it. Traditionally, when you're actually going to the FX market to exchange for another currency, you need a bank account that holds that currency. Not all bank accounts holds more than one currency, right? Like in, in, US, in the US, like 
your bank account probably holds like can hold like euro and a bunch of other stuff. But in most of the countries, it, like it can't hold more than one currency. But in crypto, this works differently. So in, instead of using like an account based paradigm, like where you have to open an account for each type of asset, in crypto, it's actually a token based paradigm. So your account, essentially, is your wallet can hold multiple type of assets. So this changes things dramatically. That means in your wallet, you know, like ERC20 wallet or whatever other chain you're using, you can have like a stable coin of Euro or USD or like of any other type. And like, so when you're exchanging to the pool with your USD stable coin, you're already getting back the Euro stable coin in your wallet already. You don't need like a bank account to actually send the, the traditionally in effect, you probably need like an account that holds a, a Euro to send it elsewhere or to just own it, to do whatever you, to spend it, to do whatever you want. But in, in, in crypto, the, um, the token-based paradigm actually changes that by a lot. So that's why like another point I wanna say, um, uh, they've been probably interested in this. Yeah, so that's why like when CBDCs come out, uh, like we'll really see like a good adoption in this. Yeah, because like, in, like when interop interoperability happens, like um, in a single wallet, people can hold multiple types of currencies, which is really, really good, yeah. I just wanna follow up. So if you're gonna only buy one, so that you're not gonna get the liquidity pool token because you're not going to actually own a, or will you get the liquidity pool token even if you put one token in because the liquidity it, pool it, token represents the, the, the a, a share of the pool yes yes um your liquidity pool token yeah not only represents a share of the pool also it's a kind of like a receipt of like you're participating in the pool and you're, and and you're uh, right to the fees it, right? yes yes and um yeah, so like there's other other protocols also have liquidity um, tokens. So like a uh, curve balancer, a couple other exchanges as well. They don't use a constant equation. You also don't have to, and, and curve also, uh, curve even uses like three tokens in the pool or like four tokens in the pool. So like, they, yeah, so they can all work very differently. So like uh, you can still provide one side and get liquidity um, it, 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 it maybe it just represents your share differently. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking about from the, from the benefit of the, of the remitter, because they're going to put one in and they're going to get a, sh a share based on a, a, on a calculation, um, that would give them the share of the liquidity, the, the portion of the pool based on a formula, I'm assuming. And then, um, so that's, I was just thinking about how it like economically might really improve upon what is currently the structure because there's the there's there's also intermediary functions inside of this yes no you've yeah. gotten rid of intermediaries there's those intermediary transactions that are still occurring yeah um I, yeah you know, the, each one has a, like a fee attached to it yeah the, I, I, yeah, I think there's a lot, a lot of components in there. Um, yeah, I think uh, what's happening here is that this is actually fiendishly, well, maybe not fiendishly, but complicated. Uh, we have just touched upon, uh, you know, some of the concepts and Mark, Money and Kirti and others have, um, you know, tried to get at the details of this. Uh, and this is, you know, in order to uh, read about the Roxy, you can read their white paper or you can read my uh, interpretation of their white paper in Forbes, uh, which talk about the intermediate currencies and so on. Um, and uh, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, so unfortunately we have to, we have to uh, you know, finish the session and get off, but we can always extend it by a few minutes depending on, of course, how one's time and everybody else's time. Uh, the, I think uh, we have to follow up on this and we have to do a deeper dive into the AMM stuff, but with an open call like this, it's very difficult because we don't know whether the same people will show up in the next call, whether we need to go over the same ground again, you know, it's always like that. So maybe we'll have a backgrounder that people are required to read before uh, before we start on the you know how the intermediate uh, currencies work and so on and so forth. 
um, you know, it's uh, it's quite complex because the crypto economics of it is also, I mean, you know, applying the DeFi paradigm to uh, FX trading is a very novel concept. And that's why we have it here in this uh, uh, capital markets uh, special interest group. Um, of course, it can be also extended to other types of assets, which is the beauty of the capital market space that you would be able to try trade, let's say, Tesla stock for uh, US, USD. But I don't know whether you can still trade Tesla stock for IBM stock. I mean, that's that's going to be a different thing altogether. <laughs> you know, that's almost like uh, making those assets interoperate in a, in novel and different ways uh, uh, because we always go to the uh, intermediate currency fiat currency meaning selling tesla for usd then us using the usd to buy ibm you know something like that uh, but all of this is uh, very interesting and i think uh, we have to continue this conversation later and I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Hauhan for showing up. If there's anybody else who has anything else to add, uh, we'd be glad to hear that. Thank you. Is there any anyone who wishes to uh, talk about something similar, but you know, in a, in, a, in a short period, like 30 seconds or something like that? Well, I guess, um, Right now, we uh, end the session and we'll continue our uh, uh, conversation on Balancer, on Avi, and of course, Roxy. And uh, thanks to Hauhan and to Eric and we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Vipin, for having me. Uh, it really, like, I, I'm sure, like, people probably have a lot more questions. Um, so, like, uh, my, my telegram and my contact info is here, and also, like, for both of my companies also here. Um, I, I do enjoy, like, in free time answering, like, people's random questions about, like, crypto trading, like, high-frequency trading, or just, like, blockchain or, like, DeFi stuff in general. So, like, feel free to, like, DM me on Twitter or, like, just reach out to me in Telegram. I'll, I'll respond. Yeah. But Thank really, you. thanks a lot, everyone, for like being here and uh, being like really engaging as well. And uh, yeah, again, thanks, Vipin, for having me and uh, Hyper Ledger for the opportunity. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Vipin, Eric here. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, we'll meet again soon. Kirti, you have something to say? No, not at all. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.